to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. We are nearly a week after the United States Supreme Court released its ruling overturning Roe v. Wade, the landmark decision from the 1970s that legalized abortion in the United States. And it has been a difficult weekend and week for many folks out there following that announcement or following that decision made by the court. And I wanted to reach out to Robin Schwartz, who is somebody who has researched this, has done a lot of work both on the academic side and in the community regarding access to abortion, an abortion doula, in fact. So a a lot of experience in the field, a lot of knowledge, both contemporary knowledge and how this decision might impact Canada and where the abortion debate stands in Canada today, but also has a lot of great Uh, historical context to put into this whole discussion. So uh, I was very excited that Robin, who has done a lot of press uh, over the past week, uh, was able to find some time to talk to me and get into some of the historical context of it and what it all means for today. So let's get right into my chat with Robin Schwarz. All right. And Robin Schwarz, a historian and abortion doula, joins me now. Robin, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Sean? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I, on what I know has been a very busy weekend for you. We are recording this Monday, the 27th, I believe, of June. Today's the 27th. Uh, so, Rob, before we get into some of the specifics of what we want to talk about, just what has the weekend been like for you uh, following the announcement on Friday? Wasn't necessarily a surprise the decision that was made, given that the leak had come out about a month ago, but uh, just what was the weekend like? What was Friday like? Uh, and sort of how do you feel now that we're a couple of days removed from that official decision being released? Yeah. Well, for folks who don't know, um, I, I am based in Ontario. So um, this has been kind of a month of, of hard news. Um, and I would say for me personally, as someone who kind of like works around these issues in Canada, the Doug Ford re-election is something I've still been kind of coping with, especially as an on like my my PhD research is on Ontario history, and so I still don't understand how Mike Harris got re-elected, much less uh, Doug Ford in 2022. And so, and so with that backdrop and and sunny <laughs> disposition. Um, <laughs> I had been checking every morning around 10 a.m. to see what the news was last week because I am a bit of a legal history nerd. I listened to a really nerdy legal history podcast uh, called Boom Lawyered. And um, so they are these two journalists there, Amani Gandhi and Jessica Mason Piclo. They had been talking about this for several years. So I because I follow them so intensely it wasn't just that I knew it was coming. It's that I also was prepared for that day after the leak came out. Um, and I think that that leak to me felt a lot heavier because that was as soon as like, if you understand the Supreme court, you understand that something being leaked means it is happening. Like that's just like a decision is not written. If it's not going to be released, it, it's not like a draft in like, I don't know, like, again, making a Doug Ford comparison, like Ford pulling us on a Tuesday being like, should I reopen playgrounds? Like, no, like this is like that document coming out was essentially like a piece of history being released early. Um, And then from there, I been doing a lot of interviews um, and trying to check in with as many friends and folks as possible. Um, I've had a lot of people message me wanting to help, which is really exciting um, but also overwhelming in many ways because um, I think that Canadians are good hearted and well intentioned. But um, as someone who started kind of doing this work in 2016 around various things, um, it was it's it's been a learning process. And I don't think it's something that you can just 
like have someone come and stay at your house tomorrow, like things change, uh, stuff happens. And so, yeah, it just, uh, trying to take as much time as I can, but also get stuff out there because it's, it's go time. Yes. A lot certainly going on over the weekend. So let's get into some of the specifics, Robin, when we're talking about abortion in Canada, I think so much of the discussion, at least in the public realm surrounds Things like Morgan Toller, uh, the Tremblay case in, in 89, even Bill C-43 in 1991. And, and you saw it last night on The National. They interviewed Morgan Toller's son, I believe, yeah. to get to get his thoughts on everything going on. But for you and, and people who study this more in depth, how should we consider abortion in Canada and how can we place it within a larger narrative? Because certainly it's not an issue that just came up in the second half of the 20th century. It's not new in that regard. Part of why I was so excited to talk to you is um, this piece in terms of um, the history of abortion in Canada is actually what led me to this work. I was in my second year of my PhD at Western and a very aggressive club was on my campus spreading anti-abortion misinformation. But at the same time, I was also teaching the second year required Canadian history survey. And one of the articles in that, that Robert Wardoff and Ellen McEachern had on their syllabus, and I believe still do, was um, one of Angus McLaren's pieces in the Canadian Historical Review about the history of birth control in Canada. So the way that I like to talk to students about this is specifically, um, I believe it's 18... 92, uh, the criminal code is amended. Um, I could be off by one year there. Uh, I do have ADHD. I tend to be off by one number uh, constantly. Um, but essentially that year at the end of the 19th century is when abortion becomes criminalized in Canada. Saying that a different way, prior to the 1890s in Canada, abortion was entirely legal. It was normal. And it was something that all pregnant people did. Uh, I definitely think it's important to talk about the role of Indigenous midwives here and the ways that Indigenous women and their knowledge of uh, various ways to end pregnancy actually helped settler women in Canada uh, when they were coming over. And so that's really what we see in early Canada and the ways that pregnancy is dealt with. And then there's a transition that happens after the First World War. Um, and this is true around the world, but within Canada, the specific context is in, where I'm located in Kitchener, Ontario. And essentially in the 1910s, 1920s, we see the rise of the eugenics movement around the world. And a part of that is fears around racial suicide. So fears that people who are marginalized, uh, poor women in Canada, uh, and in the Canadian in context, uh, Catholic women, because we know with the divide um, between English and, and French Canada at that time, more middle and upper class Protestant women were using birth control as a way of controlling uh, their pregnancies versus uh, those who lived in Catholic Canada. And so there are fears essentially coming from elites, um, the most prominent name being A.R. Kaufman in that time period. And Kaufman is a um, businessman in Kitchener. He owns a rubber factory, so he's creating condoms. Um, and he basically forms a birth control organization to start spreading that information uh, similar to the work that Margaret Sanger is doing in the United States with Planned Parenthood. But differently, and this is the important difference um, that McLaren talks about in his uh, work, Kaufman's goal, because he represents such an extremist eugenics view, is uh, for essentially the poor to be having fewer children. And so he hires nurses to go door to door and essentially hand out as much birth control information as possible, because that is a cheaper way of providing pregnant people with that information versus what we see Margaret Sanger and Mary Stopes doing uh, in the UK, where they are setting up independent clinics in terms of uh, fitting women with diaphragms, um, actually like giving them instructions and information and making them feel seen and heard and loved through that process. 
Um, not to say that they were perfect either, because we know um, that in terms of their relationship with women of color, it's it's not good. And that's, again, always an important part of this story. But essentially, what we see is Canada and, and co- led by Kaufman, creating a system of birth control that is very coercive. So Kaufman is known for offering sterilizations to his factory workers as a way of keeping them on the job. And he's a big fan of mailing spermicide places because his goal is lowering essentially unmentionable folks having fewer pregnancies. And that's a huge problem. And and that's something that I think gets missed in terms of telling this story as a Canadian story. But then from there, and we we see uh, sort of fast forwarding to the 1960s, where um, there's the rise of c- civil rights movements around the world. Canada begins to have what I would call the best feminist socialist movement in the Western world at the time. And so the big first important date there that folks may have heard of is the 1970 abortion caravan. I had the privilege two years ago of co-editing a project around that where basically we, it was the 50th anniversary project and I got to work with many of the original caravanners to tell both tell that story and release a series of 10 issue papers uh, on the Action Canada for Sexual and Health website with essentially members of the movement across the last 50 years. And so that abortion caravan moment is essentially like abortion has been criminalized from 1892, but we're seeing by the 1960s, people starting to push back against that. And that culminates in Pierre Elliott Trudeau decriminalizing and changing the law around abortion. I don't want to say decriminalization, but changing the law around abortion in uh, 1969 through the omnibus bill that also partially changes the rules around homosexuality as well. And I, again, I'm I'm being very careful with my language here. Um, I know that uh, folks like Gary Kinsman have done some really fantastic scholarship around the 1969 omnibus bill, but essentially that bill sets up what is called therapeutic abortion committees. And those committees are set up at hospitals and they are three doctors who women essentially have to stand in front of and say, I want an abortion. And then if those three doctors approve it, you will get access to that health care. So that's sort of the the background and story to when the movement of um, not to say that people of color and, and Indigenous women haven't always been resisting those state, state apparatuses in Canada, but in terms of the feminist movement, the women's rights movement, and the the people that Morgenthaler worked with, that's really the background that we see that happening and, and beginning to, to take form in Canada in the 70s. I'm curious, how do we assess then or, or try to come to terms with this transformation of sorts where, you know, you're talking about Kaufman, you're talking about eugenics movement and, and the forced sterilization of individuals as that being part of the history certainly of abortion in Canada to the dominant narrative then in the second half of the, the 20th century is the push by women to advocate for access to abortion and other you know reproductive rights really family planning those are seem to me to to kind of be different things where you have it being forced and used coercively earlier on by these individuals who are talking about to the more grassroots movement, perhaps of the second half of the 20th century. Like, like where was that or, or was that anywhere in the first half of the 20th century or was it too much dominated, at least publicly, by Victorian ideology and and the church still being very powerful. Like, like, was there anything similar early on in the 20th century that we see later on of grassroots women coming together, advocating for more control and more recognition of reproductive rights? Yeah. So I know that there was um, a clinic set up in Hamilton that was connected with Planned Parenthood in the United States, very similarly. And I know um, that Kaufman supported, oh my gosh, what's her name? I'm so bad at 
remembering my like specific details. Basically, they challenged the criminal code around spreading birth control information. And that's why Kaufman gets the reputation he does in terms of being a good person, because he's the money behind this case, supporting this one social worker whose name is... Dorothea Palmer. Essentially, there are women in Hamilton who are trying to set up a birth control clinic, but the big barrier here is cost. So Kaufman, the reason that he becomes the important person in the movement in Canada is he has the money to pay people to basically spread birth control information at a time where there is significant stigma around that in terms of what you said about Victorian ideals and ideas um, in terms of like the 1920s. And um, I think about like some of Cynthia Camacchio's work here around sexuality and the ways that that is evolving during the same time period, right? Like fears around youth in the cities, like all of these things are happening together, But essentially by the 1930s, a social worker named Dorothea Palmer in Ontario challenges that uh, essentially she's arrested for spreading birth control information because that's a part of what is illegal. Kaufman's money and being supported by Kaufman allows them to win that case, which then allows for birth control is still illegal until 1968 in terms of um, the actual pill. But it does change in terms of the landscape. But I think that it's important to recognize here that my other work and my actual dissertation stuff is on the 1968 Divorce Act and its impact on Ontario as one of the big parts of it. And Canada is often about 30 to 40 years behind the UK and the United States on these sorts of law things in my, like, that's, that's the specific example I'm pointing to, but it's definitely something where we are being impacted by those two countries and Stopes and Sanger are able to get money for the type of clinical model that they want to run. Kaufman is not interested in paying for that. And so he really is like a prudent businessman. And in some ways, like, that's why he gets this credit for spreading birth control and being the father of birth control in Canada. But it's a really actual dark history when you look into it. And um, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised given that uh, McLaren's book was published in 1986, that we don't talk about this more in terms of like the uniquely Canadian aspect of this um, in the same way that say we would talk about residential schools and how like forced sterilization is happening at the same time with regu- with laws in Alberta and Saskatchewan, right? Like these things are all connected systemically in terms of who the state wants to have children and who the state is saying, no, your children are a burden or you are not fit to parent So in terms of this time period, like, we're seeing the solidification of social work. We're seeing the rise of the medical profession as doctors being the main actual, like, people and and setting up sort of those early hospitals and things. So this piece, uh, this birth control history is a part of that. And with abortion, um, I think it's just important for folks to understand that this is uniquely not Canadian, but it's not until the 1920s that the medical profession decides to start telling pregnant people that life begins at conception. So that is a part of that fear around racial suicide and eugenics and and poverty and all these things that are happening in the 1920s that are happening again in the 2020s, because we're seeing that right in front of us right now of essentially wanting you other external factors leading to all of these fears Um in our communities and the ways that different uh, inequalities kind of grow. How much does the advent or the advances in medicine influence these discussions too? When you compare them to, as you just said, from the 2020s to the 1920s, because as as someone who certainly is not an expert, it seems to me that uh, the advances in medicine, in, as well as the accessibility of it, and we'll get to accessibility uh, in, in a minute, but just in terms of Canada, at least, 1920s, this is before universal health care. So, so there is some barriers or there are barriers to access. And while there are still barriers to access 
today across the country, no question. Hopefully, it's lesser than, and certainly there are, are greater advancements in medicine today. So how can we assess the decisions that were made back then, the discussion around it back then, comparing it to today when at least medically the situations are completely different? So I would say, interestingly, in some ways, the rise of technology over the last hundred years has both, it's done two things. So in positively, it has obviously improved health co- outcomes, as you just said. So one of the big things I've heard a lot of people, not just Canadians, I, I want to say North America and worldwide doing is talking about coat hanger abortions this week. Mm-hmm. And um, that's definitely the case in terms of what prompts the changes to the laws in the 60s and 70s. Um, when the abortion caravan happens, they drive three vehicles across Canada and one of them has a coffin on the top of it. And, it's, and their chant is that women are dying and you need to do something, essentially. So in the 1960s, that's what abortion looks like if it's not being performed by someone like Henry Morgenthaler, who's setting up the independent clinics to try and solve that issue, right? And like, professionalize it, make it so that it's not just something where it's someone in a back alley, because the hospitals that are being set up as universal health care between the 1920s and the 1960s in Canada, some of them are good, and some of them are have it really depends on where you live and whether or not you have a Dr. Henry Morgenthaler type who is interested in doing that work and also other people at that hospital who are supporting them. And I say that, so specific example of that would be London, Ontario, which still has a very good abortion clinic today. That is because one doctor, Dr. Fraser Fellows, basically took the therapeutic abortion committee rule as like, a suggestion in that he still had three doctors sign off on his abortions, but he had three friends who knew that if he, as a doctor, said this person's getting an abortion, that that was happening. I know from hearing uh, one of my family members' uh, stories from the 1970s in rural BC that that was not the case and that they did, in fact, have to stand in front of a committee of three doctors at our local hospital. And so depending on what hospital you were at uh, would depend on how that happened. So in terms of like, obviously, in 2020, we are not worried about coat hanger abortions. I personally am not. If that's something that someone chooses to do, that's really scary. But there's lots of information online in 2020 about what's called self-manage abortion. So essentially, in the last 50 years, a couple things have changed. First of all, is the invention of the abortion pill, which essentially is a medication that you can take that causes um, contractions of the uterus and an expulsion of the pregnancy. It's the same, one of the medications for that is the same that we already use for miscarriages. So the advancements in pharmaceutical technology have made it such that essentially that is what an abortion looks like if you are trying to do it without a doctor, you have to try and find a way of getting these pills. And there are people online who sell them. And so again, like, that's kind of similar in some ways to what it was like before the 1920s, before doctors and kind of that professionalization where it would be like, oh, someone in rural Canada is selling you a thing that they say will do this. And you hope that that person is trustworthy and that it's not going to kill you. And so that is the experience um, of some folks. But I think that um, there's definitely more people like me out there who are online offering advice, helping. um, And that's something the Internet's allowed us to do. So that's what illegal abortion basically looks like in, in all around the world today. But more than that, um, and this is something that folks really need to understand, and I don't think we've talked enough about in the Canadian context, in that I have not seen a historian write on this. So if a master's student is listening to this and needs a project, here you go. (laughs) But basically, essentially, the rise of ultrasound technology has led to more stigmatization around abortion in many ways, because even though ultrasounds are so good in terms of health outcomes for pregnancy, we have not had a conversation about the way that 
for example, conversations about fetal rights came out of ultrasounds being widely available because that technology, which quote, allows you to see the baby, quote unquote, which is, is not scientific. Like that language I just used is not science. I used a, the language of what someone who, uh, essentially is pregnant would say, right? And so that technology, we can directly see, like ultrasound technology starts to become widely available in the early 1970s and then 80s and by the early 90s in Canada, it's everywhere. Like that trajectory over the last 50 years is the same trajectory as Roe versus Wade. And so those two things are tied together in that Yes, having an ultrasound is is making abortion safer for all of us um, and pregnancy safer. And and I just am being very careful with my language because I definitely uh, see it as connected. But it means that oftentimes, it, like I've had clients and, and friends in, in various situations today where the ultrasound technician will be anti-abortion. And so It is another kind of site where harm can be caused based on people's beliefs rather than science. So let's talk about the idea of family planning and and how abortions fit into this, because you've touched on it a little bit. And I think one of the things that comes up a lot in this discussion, and I would say mostly comes from people who are saying things not in good faith, is that abortion is used as birth control and that women who who find that they're pregnant just skip to an abortion clinic and then skip home and everything's great. And, uh, you know, I, obviously I, I don't think that that is the case. I think that that is, as I say, not something that is presented in good faith. But how do we assess all of these things put together? Because you've talked about Kaufman and, and distributing condoms, uh, other forms of birth control, pharmaceutical therapeutics that are available now, uh, plus more of a, a perhaps traditional form of abortion. How do they all fit together? And how, how can people maybe assess abortions within this larger landscape of family planning and reproductive rights? So I'm definitely going to give a shout out here to my favorite book of all time, uh, sincerely, as in my copy is destroyed. Uh, and that is Without Apology, the edited collection by Shannon Stetner, which is published by Athabasca University Press and available for free online uh, should anyone want to read more about what I'm about to say. But I, I, Shannon's a huge, really, really important scholar in this field in terms of that book. It came out in 2016 and it brought together a lot of folks from our movement, including people who were involved in the Morgenthaler case and people like me doing this work today narratives around abortion in Canada from folks who had had them. And essentially what that collection says, and and this is where, like I say, that book brings this all together so well, is first of all, that the idea that abortion and birth control is different, that again is a product of that 1920s doctor decision to essentially start stigmatizing abortion and saying that life begins at conception. So that means that male doctors who have never been pregnant decided at that time that abortion was somehow not a form of birth control, even though women and pregnant people, non like pregnant people had always seen abortion in terms of like ending a pregnancy as being different after the quickening. And the quickening is uh, essentially a word for what happens around 20 weeks in pregnancy where you can start to feel the fetus move um, more. And so uh, not to say that people haven't always ended pregnancies that they did not want. And that is true today. That is true in the past. It will always be true. But in terms of the types of abortions and the reasons and the stigma, the sort of evangelical, like, abortion is bad narratives date back to the 1920s, but then get more aggressive, in fact, after the rise of more family planning work that is happening around the world after the Second World War, but particularly in Canada in the 60s at university campuses, And we see the release of, um, I believe it's 1967, but I might again be off by a year, the um, McGill Birth Control Handbook, 
So students, inspired by all of the civil rights organizing that is happening in the late 50s and then 60s and early 70s, um, write their own guide to different forms of birth control because that's something that they feel they need and they're sharing it with folks on various university campuses across Canada. And that same sort of connection of students in various communities leads to setting up of what would become the first Planned Parenthoods in Canada. So where I'm located in Kitchener, Ontario, right now this year, Shore Centre, which was Planned Parenthood Waterloo Region, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. So essentially, as a part of the kind of post-war world planning and and connections um, between the international community, there's definitely, and and the rise of like that human rights rhetoric, which for folks who don't know, I actually, like the Morgenthaler narrative, I think in Canada, we sometimes get to, like we give him too much credit in some ways, even though like He's also an incredible person. So like, can you give the man too much credit? I don't know. But in terms of like historical narratives, it is in fact not true that Morgenthaler is the whole reason that abortion is legal in Canada. Like I I brought up the abortion caravan that starts at Simon Fraser University, which is a part of the Vancouver Women's Caucus and the organizing work that they are doing there. And so, and, and Morgenthaler himself is a Holocaust survivor who has come to Canada as an emigrant, like he emigrates to Canada in the 50s and then becomes a doctor and moves into this work because of his experience in the Holocaust and the sorts of horrors that he sees happen in Europe as a a young adult. It's one of those things where essentially by the 60s, these pieces of organizing in different groups, whether it's like Morgenthaler is a humanist, so he's a member of that movement. We've got all of these young women coming together who are saying, we want our rights, inspired by all of the movements happening around the world. But what makes Canada different, and this is where like I get excited talking about this, is that don't know why in that, like, I don't understand why the rest of the world doesn't do this either, but uh, our feminists are very smart and They're also real socialists and really good organizers. And so people like Judy Rabbit, Carolyn Egan, um, those are the women who come together. Those are the two names you know, but they're parts of countless women who come together um, through the 70s and 80s to organize around this issue. And it's literally just talking to friends and neighbors about abortion, having rallies in the street, like they see this as a long fight, but that is happening at the same time as these birth control centers are being set up in the context of the 1969 omnibus bill, which makes that change possible as well. So essentially, like when I was doing my um, research on on divorce, which is is related to this in that um, I studied and and still study single moms in Ontario because single moms are what happened when you can't access abortion in that time period, right? Mm-hmm. And and um, because divorce in Canada prior to 1968 is illegal unless in case of adultery, mm-hmm. i.e., if your husband beats you, you can't leave your marriage. Right. That is like that's that was the law. As a result, this sort of push, when I was in the archives at LH, LAC um, looking at some documents around just divorce, I was looking at things like the Vanier Institute of the Family, which is set up in the 60s uh, in order to answer these questions uh, in terms of what does better access to family planning information look like for Canadians and places like what is now Shore Center are set up in essentially late 60s, early 70s. But a lot of these folks are just really grassroots volunteer places like Shore itself. um, I'm, I'm really proud. I've, I worked there until last year and I'm still a volunteer um, and friend. Shore was mostly run by volunteers until about 20 years ago. So these are very much like women like me who want to help their community and 
then eventually they do get connected with Dr. Morgenthaler, but that is an 18 year story. And so I just think that like all of that context is really important in terms of understanding that Judy Rabbit quotes Henry Morgenthaler in her memoir um, and talks about how Morgenthaler was kind of the outlier within the medical community in terms of this issue. But that doesn't mean that there weren't other people like it's it's really just the 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 state and and when I say the state I mean like doctors, lawyers, like professionals, politicians, police officers who are not seeing how important this is. But in that quote, Judy Rebick says Henry Morgan Thaler turned to me and said the cops are against us, the state is against us, the politicians are against us, but the people Judy, the people are with us and so they were. And something magic happens in those 18 years. Like, I want to replicate it within my lifetime. I have, it's so amazing that they are able to essentially educate on such a level where, for the most part, and I say that uh, because the other side would say, well, we have polls saying otherwise, but most Canadians know that abortion is healthcare and most Canadians are pro choice. Like, I would say that 99% of this country is pro choice. I think that there's a lot of, um, as you just kind of brought up, questions around like, well, is it birth control? Is it this? And that's where uh, without apology is really great because it goes into the nuances of these conversations and the ways that like there is no bad reason in that like what real choice looks like is different for every person. And what we really need to do is just uh, treat it like any other form of healthcare. Now, you mentioned that that book, and we'll link to that in the show notes below, but it's one of the few things that are available. We've talked about this before a little. We started to record. Why are Canadian historians not focused on abortion? Why is this issue not received a lot of attention? And, and really, where does the the state of the literature lie? And how much do you think that lack of writing might influence some of the contemporary discussions surrounding it since we don't have a lot of the the really good contextual material that you just referenced. A couple things. I don't want to say that it's just Canadian historians because I think that abortion is a hard thing to write about historically regardless because I was very lucky at Western to take um, Dr. Robert Wardoff's um, Canada, Canada and its Historians class, which is his um, big Canadian historiography course. And he's so, like, just knows so much about the different types of history in Canada. And um, one of the weeks is on sexuality. And a lot of our discussion in those seminars was about how sex is not, it's really hard to write about sex because the ways that that shows up in the archives is different than say my stuff on divorce where I can read what Pierre Elliott Trudeau actually thought about divorce because he was saying it in the Hansard, right? Right. And so today, like this is, this is a longstanding thing, but even today, We do not have good data on the number of abortions in Canada. I'm sure, like, you have dealt with this in your work as well. Uh, Canada tends to have some of the worst freedom of information laws just in terms of waiting for things or even being able to get access to certain files. But I think with this, it's because of the story I just described to you where, it, and it's still true, where you live matters in terms of access to this procedure in this country. There is not like a central, like, this is what was happening database. Right. And I think part of that is that hospitals, like, so my knowledge of that stuff in London, the reason I know about that one doctor in London who like, wasn't really following the official rules in terms of the therapeutic abortion committees and how they were supposed to work is because I was helping a medical student in Shelley McKellar's history of medicine class at Western with this question in context in terms of like he I was like oh I care about this because I'm doing activism on campus let's talk about your project because he was interviewing a bunch of the doctors uh, who had retired in London for that so not a historian someone doing that work and again, not published. 
Um, and so I think it, the honest answer is that, so that there's a data issue is, is in summary. And that makes it, for example, like I mentioned earlier that the Bedroom in the State by uh, Agnes and Arlene McLaren is still one of the best books on this subject, even though it came out in 1986. Like that's, there are very few topics within Canadian historiography where I can think of where I would hand a student a book from 1986 and say, read this yeah. because it's pre-cultural turn. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's pre a lot of things. And mm -hmm. this book still is great. Like I, I literally was reading it recently for, cause I'm working on some stuff on Kaufman um, because it's come up locally in Kitchener politics, but um, Shannon Stetner's done some, a lot of incredible work. But Shannon never got a tenure track job. So there's uh, it basically, in, in summary, very similar systemic barriers, I think, that exist to a lot of good history happening in Canada, where, like, I think of my own personal experience. I started my PhD at Western in 2014. And by the time I kind of knew what I wanted to do and, and where I was going in terms of maybe getting a job one day, one position had been posted in my field in the five years I had been in the program in terms of Canadian women's history. And that job went to Lisa Pasoli at Queens, who had already won the Clio Prize for Best Book in BC History. <laughs> So I, I think that, like, there's a lot of really good work on this in master's theses. Like, I know there's a master's thesis and, and a couple master's projects at the University of Waterloo, which uh, would have been done either by Wendy Mitchinson or by people who knew Wendy Mitchinson because she was there. And the Kaufman archives were put there in the mid-2000s. So the edited collection that came out through UBC Press a couple years ago, um, Abortion, History, Politics, and Reproductive Justice After Morgenthaler, edited by Shannon Stetner, Kristen Burnett, and Travis Hay. Very good collection. Lots of really good articles about this stuff in terms of things that matter to what I'm saying and, and deep dives into some of the stuff that we're going over here. But again, many like these authors also in the um, readings in Canadian women's history and gender history, like a lot of these articles are very much where I see a lot of women's history in Canada being where it's like, let's tell the story of this thing, but it doesn't go into necessarily like the big picture. And I'm definitely a big picture political historian. I'm someone who like, my honors thesis is on Nixon and Trudeau, which is probably not something I should be staying in in terms of my <laughs> feminist cred. But I, I came to Ontario to study Canadian American relations and was inspired by like the kind of bigger names in that field. And I've since obviously realized that those people are not like me. I am neurodivergent and queer and, and those histories don't include people like me. But saying that, there's been a lot of discussion, I think, amongst the historians who have done sort of like the one article on this type of abortion, I think, about, in terms of uh, where the field might go and writing stuff from a reproductive justice-based lens hasn't really happened yet. But that's true of a lot of stuff in this field in Canadian research. And for folks who don't know, reproductive justice is a theoretical feminist concept that comes out of the United States in the mid nineties in response to uh, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton's healthcare bill, which does not include abortion in the lead up to the Cairo conference on uh, international population that the UN is having and essentially black women in the United States, but also Asian women and indigenous women and, and just a lot of, uh, really great organizers come together to say that this has to be done through a human rights lens. And so it's the idea of moving past just talking about abortion as like, oh, let's just talk about what happened uh, and seeing it as a part of a, a human rights framework. So the, it's the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, and the right to parent those children in safe and healthy uh, communities. And so um, I think about the type of work that someone like Allison Stevenson has done on um, the 60s scoop in Saskatchewan with her book, Intimate Relations, which came out, I believe, last year. Like that book basically traces how the child welfare system in Saskatchewan was set up 
as a way of removing Indigenous children from their families, like that connects with what I just said, right? Because yeah. if a res, even the like honestly, the work on residential schools is a reproductive justice issue because you are taking away children from their families, making it unsafe for them. And I haven't heard that big narrative in Canadian history or seen that, like, like seen the book that writes it that way, the way that, like, James Daszak's Clearing the Plains just, like, laid it out in terms of theory and then bringing all of these different pieces together. Mm -hmm. And so I know that there have been some historians who have written theoretical essays calling for that in the discipline, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, saying that, that doesn't mean that things aren't in the publication pipeline, because we also know that historians are notoriously slow, and we still seem to enjoy publishing single author articles, even though no one else writes that way anymore, and it <laughs> trust us. So yeah, I think that like this collection that I just mentioned is really great, because it does bring together a lot of the different historians who have done sort of different little pieces here and there. But in terms of the book, uh, which obviously, like, again, I'm a, I'm a romantic, same thing. Like, I'm complaining here being like, oh, we only publish in books. But I'm like, yeah. but the big book, no one's yeah. written it. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, there, there's lots of good pieces, but it's like, you have to bring them all together. So I joke about, like, when I'm doing this, like, I have right behind my desk, my abortion books are all in a line. And there's a lot of really good Canadian ones, but they all sort of talk about different things. And even the, like one of the better books on the anti-abortion movement, which there hasn't been a lot of history deep dive into, because again, the archives are inaccessible in that like a lot of this stuff would be kept in private collections. Well, are they going to let someone like me look at that? Probably not. But essentially uh, Paul Surratt and Kelly Gordon, who are both uh, sociologists, um, have written a book, wrote a book several years ago called The Changing Voice of the Anti-Abortion Movement, The Rise of Pro-Women Rhetoric in Canada and the United States. So it's there, but it's not necessarily with Canadian historians, if that makes sense. Like it's sometimes, uh, I have a friend, uh, Jamie, Jamie Nicolau, who's almost done her PhD at U of T. Shout out to Jamie. She is in sociology and she's doing some really cool work on Morgenthaler and his views. And then she's done lots of interviews of various uh, members of our movement from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So folks are doing the work, but it's not necessarily being done by historians. And I see that as such a problem because in my view, and, and this was something I also mentioned to you before we started recording, the anti-abortion movement is using history in Canada as a way of like advancing their cause. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're really twisting it. And that to me says that Canadian historians are not doing a good job of like telling the bigger picture story so that folks say can't talk about like the worst anti-choicer in Canada released a thing on Saturday saying that he cried tears of joys on Friday the same way as when Abe Lincoln released the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and when the Civil Rights Law was signed in 1965, because these are both human rights issues, which is wrong. Like that, that is historically inaccurate, but that is what someone who has a Bachelor of Arts in History has been saying for 15 years. So that's a problem. And that is something that I, like, I know in my classroom, in terms of seeing the rise of fascism in the last 10 years in Canada has been really difficult in that um, I'm sure you've had those experiences too with far-right students who say things and then expect you to not. Like, you essentially, like, my experience at Western um, teaching men in particular in history was very bad, and, but that's true of most, like, I don't know, most women in history know what the discipline is like. And, and we've all, uh, like, I led a group around that at Western. And so it's not, like, it's not that these things aren't related. It's not that we can stand back and say, well, it's not my job to, like, talk about this, even if the all of the exact evidence that we want in terms of saying these things aren't there. Like I can tell you, I can see the trends and I don't need 
the direct, like specific archival evidence to tell me that these things are happening because I can see them in the world. Yeah, and it's it's important to mention or, or to you know acknowledge too, as you say, how interconnected all these various things are, and you do see it a little uh, in the classroom. I truly believe that I get shielded a little bit from it because mm -hmm. when I am teaching, I am up there. Uh, as a man. And, you know, I do get pushback from some students occasionally, usually when talking about uh, in the, the course of the things I talk about in my classes, uh, civil rights, uh, broadcasting, and also uh, surrounding colonialization. Those are the two things that really come up primarily in the courses I teach. And, and I get it a little bit, but when I hear from my women colleagues, like the, the experience that they have is, is very different from the one that I have. Uh, and so I, I try to be as cognizant of that as I can be, that the sort of how lucky I am, uh, just given who I am, that, that, that I, I get shielded a little bit, it seems, uh, from some of those negative experiences or a lot of those negative experiences. And you know, I, as you're talking, it also reminds us how important it is that historians are working on this, as you say, that there is an anti-choice movement in this country. There are protests every year here in Ottawa that lots of people, uh, or in my estimation, at least a lot of people go up to the Hill for the, what is called the right to life protest. A lot of schools actually have their students uh, mandatory to go to that uh, event. So there, there is a movement. And one of the things that came up on Friday and over the weekend uh, and a lot of the stuff I read was the thought that, that that sentiment would continue to be imported into Canada and that the tactics that were used by anti-choice advocates in the United States would continually uh, be put into place in this country as well. So, Robin, in, in your estimation, how vulnerable is Canada to that type of language and rhetoric and how can historians in particular, in your estimation, effectively put out quality material that corrects the historical record and uh, allows or does not allow, I should say, individuals to circumvent historical reality to put out a false narrative? Well, I think and so this is this is a really hard thing because I think that like you said, our discipline, and, and I, I want to name it, is very patriarchal still in that the way, like, and I don't know how to fix it because there's just so many people who think that they are on it and are allies on this issue. But then, like, so my experience was very much that I was dealing with a club at Western that was actively testing anti-abortion tactics on us. And I say that sincerely because, so they were, they're connected with the Canadian Center for Bathical Reform, which is a really important group if you want to understand this stuff in Canada. The person that I mentioned who has the BA in history, he is the communications coordinator uh, for that group. And essentially, they are set up in Canada in the mid 2000s. So there's a transition in the anti-abortion movement in North America. And I want to be clear that it is a North American wide movement. Like it is a very small fringe group in Canada, plus a lot of well-meaning Catholic white women who need to be redirected and, and helped to feel good about themselves. Because um, I truly believe that most of the, like, one person who's anti-abortion in, say, whatever city is not the actual issue. It's groups like the folks organizing the March for Life still, which is the um, Campaign Life Coalition, which is directly connected to the other one. I Like, essentially, there's a small group of, like, 20 people in Canada who are all possibly also related. That's a whole other conversation that I'm trying to figure out. Um, but, but I've been tracking them since these days at Western because I was noticing all this stuff pop up on campus that seemed too slick and too, like, like it was too nice from these students knowing what I knew about my club, like anti-abortion club and just student clubs generally. And also having grown up in Kelowna, BC, which is one of the worst anti-choice communities in Canada, like my hospital there is still protested every Tuesday. 
Um, they have a fetus fan that they drive around, Kelowna Right to Life, just to, like, shame you for your choices. And so, like, that's the the environment I came from. But when I did my undergrad at UBC Okanagan, the protesters were old people coming to campus to tell us young people that we shouldn't have abortions. And obviously, like, that's a problem. But that's different than you being told by a 19-year-old, hey, can I talk to you about how abortion is a human rights violation? Which, Mm. again, is that new rhetoric where... So I was seeing all this stuff happening in the U.S. um, in terms of trap laws, in terms of things happening, Trump getting elected. This is all happening around me at Western. And then this club pops up and I was like, wait a second, that looks like stuff you would see in the United States. That doesn't Mm -hmm. make sense to me. How are these students getting this stuff? It turns out that the head of the Canadian Center for Biological Reform lives outside of Lennon, Ontario, and these groups, these anti-abortion groups, have a lot of money um, because of both the church, but also just getting money through the United States and the ways that um, I know folks in Ottawa will have seen some of the reporting around the convoy and just money coming up through the U.S. Well, those folks learned to do that through the anti-abortion movement, and they've been doing it since the mid-2000s. And so I was seeing these students and essentially having had an abortion myself at 21 on exchange in Scotland, which at the time in, in 2016, 17, 18, when I'm doing this as a, uh, I had finished my comprehensive exams and was just working on my stuff and teaching. I knew intimately what it was like to be pregnant when you didn't want to be. Right. And I knew intimately what that experience would be like for a student at Western coming from Toronto and, and being kind of vulnerable and not knowing the city just because that's it's a campus that way. And so we started doing pro-choice tables uh, with also educational stuff around history in up beside them, because that was all the university would let us do. Hmm. And so the rest of this story is me. I was told by multiple members of the history department, both faculty and other PhD candidates, that I was being extreme with my response. I remember being told that my view that that happening on campus was a problem and that at the time um, it was also there was also a bill that I had helped uh, support through the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada, who I was organizing for at the time to make it so that anti-abortion groups couldn't get money through the Canada Summer Jobs Program. That happened in early 2018. So essentially, what I'm seeing is what I would call a giant red flag in terms of things that are happening in the U.S. happening on my very own campus and no one doing anything about them. And I had students, uh, several undergraduate co-organizers who were amazing, uh, Madeline Burke and uh, Karina Gabriel, who both have gone on to do political work. But I had zero support from my department around this. And it was often very thoughts and prayers of like, oh, that's nice, Robin, that you're doing that. But don't let it distract from your dissertation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... I I don't, like, so in terms of, like, what has happened, I would say that the law in Canada is not vulnerable because of that movement that happened to make Canada so pro-choice in that in, it like, I, one of the things that the um, field of Canadian American relations often talks about is that uh, Canada and the United States are a mirror of each other. That's one of the theories that I learned in my master's. So, We're not exactly the same, but we're kind of similar. And I would say that on this issue, we definitely diverge in that when the United States is fighting stuff through the courts and they go for the courts first, that's why Roe happens in 1973 and Morgenthaler doesn't happen until 1988. Our feminists here recognize that abortion is one of many issues that are impacting women's lives and particularly marginalized women's abilities uh, to get ahead economically. And so they work on the culture first and and essentially they start in the streets and then move to the courts after the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is put in place. That's also a key thing that people need to understand is that until the Constitution changes, Morgenthaler and those women have no interest in actually challenging the Supreme Court because they don't think they're going to win. 
And so that story, historians need to say it over and over and over and over again. And we need to teach people how that organizing happened. And we need to understand that that was different and that it was one of the best feminist movements that this world has ever seen. Saying that, after 1988, we see, uh, and this is something that I hope to to talk about uh, in more detail as I go back to maybe finishing my dissertation, uh, we see what I would call the bureaucratization of feminism. So as women's studies departments are set up, as Women and Gender Equity Canada gets more funding, it becomes paid positions. But as a result, because we are moving away from that more activist side of things, we then get into this place where it's like, I am living in, in 2018, being ignored by uh, university administrators, because I did send multiple messages to the equity office, never heard anything, and sending out messages online on social media to say, hey, students, this is what's happening in the center of your campus today. So if you want to go get a coffee, I'll go do that for you if you don't have the capacity to do that because you're maybe emotional because you had an abortion last week. And so what I am telling you is that anti-abortion movement has been organizing on Canadian campuses for the last decade and making more progress on campus than they have anywhere else. And that it is, in fact, universities and their fear of, like, free speech issues around this, which, again, as I used to say when I was at Western, if there were folks carrying signs on campus saying that Black people don't belong here, I think that my professors would have had a problem with that. So why, then, is a sign that says that abortion is a human rights violation, which is scientifically and historically inaccurate, not something that every single professor on that campus is doing something about. And so it's it's a matter of telling that history, sharing that story, making uh, young women in particular feel good and connected in the fact that that movement was intersectional. But it is then also our duty to actually talk about what has happened since and not be afraid of offending People who, again, it's it's the same as, like, you. everyone wonders why the anti-vaccine movement is so strong in 2022. Well, I could have told you that would have happened because abortion is the canary in the coal mine around this. And all accurate science, like, abortion is the most researched medical procedure because of all the stigma and misinformation and misogyny that we have had to prove over and over and over again that it is safe, that it is an important, vital thing. And yet that's not being represented on university campuses across Canada. And I know, um, like I wrote a piece on this uh, for the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada in 2019. It was either published in late 2019 or early 2020, essentially talking about how anti-abortion groups were using different university campuses, because it's the same five people traveling the country, testing and seeing, hey, is you Ottawa going to allow us to have pink and blue flags to represent all of the poor dead babies, which I like the story for folks who if that's offensive, but it's true, like that's what was happening on our campus. And it's like, excuse me, that's not accurate at all. That's not what abortion is. And how is it that I am having to teach, like I'm at my workplace being harassed by these people. It's not okay. And so that was happening before, like that's where their main focus has been. And then now we're seeing them try to move into politics in terms of electing folks like Sam Oosterhoff, um, who is the uh, far right MPP um, in Ontario, or even Jason Kenney, like the the anti abortion group right now helped support Jason Kenney becoming leader of the United Conservative Party of Alberta, because what they're doing now is essentially trying to bring the political side of things to the Canada in terms of how does change happen, i.e., canvassing, going to Conservative Party conventions and trying to pass various motions. Um, and these are things that we are not seeing happen on the other side with the same level of fervor. And so it's not that the law is at risk, 
But abortion access in Canada is abysmal and has always been abysmal if you live outside of uh, Toronto and Vancouver. And so we need to look at the healthcare system and we need to make sure that we are investing significantly into reproductive health. And that means more midwives on reserves, more um, support for abortion providers in school. Like, you have to pay as a medical student to go to conferences to learn to become an abortion provider still out of your own pocket. And on top of that, there's also a conference, the other side, flip of the coin, the Doctors for Life will pay for medical students all expenses to go to their weekend conference every year. So if you want to go and become an anti-abortion provider and you're a, a Western medical sc- student, be my guest. You can go and they'll pay for you to do it full expense. If you want to go yourself, you're fundraising. So it really does speak to the the inequality of access. And one of the reasons to why it's so important to continue to talk about these issues, to get the research out there, uh, to, to source it out. Like I said, we'll link to the Shannon Stetner a resource in the links or in the show notes down below. So check that out. And, and Robin, if you, people want to keep up with you and what you got going on uh, and some of the other resources that are available, where would you point them to and how can people follow along with this discussion? Yeah. Um, so my Twitter is still the best place. Uh, I was definitely one of those academics who thought that Twitter was going to be the next big thing, which uh, I obviously hate myself for that now because <laughs> it's a uh, dumpster fire, but uh, it means that my Twitter is quite good. And so uh, it's at R-O-B-Y-N-S-C-H. And then the other thing I'm working on, Sean, uh, that speaks to sort of these more systemic issues, because as you can tell, like abortion to me is just a way of talking about a lot of big issues. Um, and that's part of why it's been such a, a joy to be a part of this movement, because I think that unlike the United States, the women who worked on this really did try to form a, a multi-generational, multi-class, multi, multi-ethic multi movement in the 70s and 80s. There were obviously flaws um, as they, like any movement, but um, yeah, definitely more working class voices and, and immigrant voices um, in our movement here than what you hear coming out of the U.S. in terms of feminist discussion from like the criticisms of the white leadership um, and the the upper class women who have essentially allowed this to happen. So I am I am launching in the fall um, a new project called the Uncampaign School. Uh, it is uncampaignschool.org. Uh, and if folks want to go there, there's a mailing list you can sign up for. Um, but I'm going to be teaching essentially the types of uh, things that the abortion caravan and the women of the abortion rights movement in Canada did for those 18 years and and trying to find ways to bring academics, activists, and community leaders together because we're not talking that way. And that was part of what Shannon was doing with that, without apology. And I'm really thankful for that book and, and want to continue on that legacy. But on a more grassroots, like, like I miss teaching students, it, to be honest, I need to come up with a way <laughs> <laughs> having, having tutorials, but, um, but yeah, I, I, and so that will be something, it will be primarily Southwestern Ontario based, but there's going to be a virtual component as well. Cause um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I was diagnosed with ADHD last year at 32. And so accessibility to me is really, really important and making this work fun and, and enjoyable. And I think that um, that's something that we've also lost uh, in terms of the last couple of years, especially just because things have felt so hard. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we will link to all that in the show notes. Uh, a lot of great stuff out there. And, and Robin, you're doing terrific work and uh, certainly support you as much as possible here uh, through the show. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. So there you have it. My chat with Robin Schwarz and my thanks, of course, for joining me taking some time out of what I know is a very busy schedule as Robin has a lot of requests to comment on all the goings on right now. And uh, as we say, we will link to a bunch of resources in the show notes, as well as the things that Robin mentioned. And if you want to keep up with everything going on at Robin S C H and that's Robin with a Y a lot of great resources out there and, and follow along with the contemporary discussion as well as the history of a very important topic for sure. So 
with that, I will say thank you very much for listening, everybody. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. Do likes, ratings, comments, all that other good stuff. Helps other people find the show and keeps us growing. And of course, head on over to activehistory.ca. All of our past episodes are available under the podcast tab. The website is going on a bit of a break for the summer. There's not going to be a lot of written material over there. But as I always say, you can use that search bar. A lot of really good stuff, uh, pretty much anything related to Canadian history. You put it in that search bar, something interesting will come up for you. So I encourage you to do that. And as always, you can also let me know what you want to hear in the show, historyslam at gmail.com, or you can find me on Twitter at the Sean Graham. So that'll be it for this week. Have a wonderful long weekend, everybody. If you're listening to this as we release it, uh, have a safe, happy long weekend. We'll be back with you again next week. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.